This is a wonderful opportunity for some information to be given out. There are some wonderful people going to speak with you this afternoon. I would just like to preface this with saying this is an afternoon of information. It's an opportunity for us to have a, a time to take a look at how we think and how we feel about certain issues going on in our country or possibly going on in our personal life. I would just like to say it's not an afternoon of debate. It is an afternoon of information. It is very, very touchy in some places. There is an opportunity for us to learn something, to see something, and maybe to discover something. So actually what I'm asking is that we have an opportunity this afternoon to keep an open mind, have an open thinking about the possibilities of what is happening in the world and in this country. And there will be an opportunity for you to question both Ted and Bryce at the end. Today we will have a Q&A. So I'd basically like to suggest is that as they are talking, if you have questions, if things come up in your mind, write them down so that we'll have the opportunity to answer those questions and deal with them during the Q&A. Also, any of you that might possibly have cell phones, turn them off, please. Any of you that may have pagers, please turn those off, or at least put them on vibrate so you can enjoy the call. <laughs> OK. The bathrooms. I know we're going to take breaks this afternoon. So the bathrooms are at the end of the hall down here. Um, have that on your mind. Please, no cameras. Anybody have a camera? Please, no cameras um, and no recording equipment. We're taking care of all of that. And just so that you will know, we are shooting from the back of the room and from the side. You will not be seen. If anyone has any considerations about that, we will not, don't, you know, just take that out of your mind consideration. There are going to be more about the people that are talking up here. Even when you're doing the question, you have questions and that sort of thing, don't worry about it. We're not going to be videotaping you, okay? And with that, are there any law enforcement people here? Local, national, federal, worldwide? If so, would you please identify yourself? Pardon me? MIBs? <laughs> or wannabes, I don't know. You know <laughs> is that what you were really saying? You wannabes, you know. All right. So we've taken care of that part of the legality of all that worldness or wonderfulness there. Um, I'm just going over my list here and see if there's anything else that... Um, who are you? Who am I? Why would you want to know that? And who are you? I'm not paranoid, but who are you? I see, I knew that. I'll be if I give you my name's Paul. OK. And basically, I also want to thank Annie, who sponsored this. And I work, basically, I work with Annie. And um, she has taken a large step of coming out and supporting something that she heartfully believes in. Einstein made a statement one time of saying, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I can't remember it verbatim, but he made the statement that it is basically impossible to prepare, or to, it is impossible to have peace when a world is preparing for war. I would just say that to each and every one of us today to look at where the peace is within ourselves. The peace, the harmony, and the opportunity to take in information that will be given today that we might be able to move our life forward and then move the world around us forward. And that's really kind of what this day is about. So with no further ado from Paul, <laughs> what I would, who I would like to introduce to you right now is Ted Gunderson, who is going to share some information with you. After Ted has finished, there will be like a 10-minute break. 
and then we'll come back and Bryce Taylor will be talking with you, then we will have another break and they will have Q&A because we understand that you know the backside can only take so much as the brain is trying to assimilate things. So with no further ado, Ted Gunderson. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. I've been retired from the FBI for uh, 20 years, over a little over 20 years, and it was quite by accident I became involved in these issues. When I talk about these issues, I'm talking about a vast number of topics. And these issues involve the very highest level of the government, <clears throat> the very highest level of uh, the top industrial and businessmen in the world. And it took me some 17 years before I realized I was able to document some of the topics that will be discussed here today, topics that I'll talk about and also topics that Bryce will talk about. Anyway, I retired from the FBI in 1979. At the time, I had over 700 personnel under my command, $22 million budget. I was one of the top executives in the organization. And shortly after my retirement, I opened a private investigative firm, among other things, consulting and so forth. And one of my clients was the friend of Dr. Jeffrey R. MacDonald. Dr. MacDonald is a former Green Beret doctor who was convicted of murdering his wife and two children in Fort Bragg, February 17, 1970. This was in 1979, nine years later. He had just been convicted and was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. I visited Dr. McDonald. He said, I'm innocent. I said, Doctor, if you're innocent, I'll work the case from now until we're able to get you free. He's still serving three consecutive life sentences and I'm still working the case. Within 10 months of obtaining the case, I talked to the girl in the floppy hat who was standing on the corner, for those of you who are aware of the story, Fatal Vision, movie book, best-selling book. Mike of the MP en route to the scene at 4.30 in the morning, <clears throat> saw this girl, floppy hat, I talked to her, obtained a confession from her October 25, 1980. The girl's name was Helena Stokely. Helena told me, Dr. McDonald did not commit these murders. They were committed by her satanic cult group, and it was her initiation into the cult that night. They left Dr. McDonald for dead. And in one of her statements, in another statement, she said that they left him alive so he could suffer, having lost his family and knowing full well that he'd be framed. So there's always, in these cases, there's always going to be some conflict. But basically, I went public with the information and on national TV, national radio. People absolutely came out of the woodwork from all over the country and said, hey, I know all about the satanic movement in the country today. I'm trying to get out. I'm multi-generation. And it goes on and on and on. I couldn't believe it because people from Washington were telling the same story as individuals from Florida and New England to California to the Southwest and Middle West and so forth. That was the beginning of my education. Now, why did they go after the McDonald family. This cult was involved in distributing drugs up and down the East Coast. At that time, they were bringing drugs with plastic bodies in the bad body cavities of the dead GIs coming out of Southeast Asia. They, they, the CIA and the Army, the biggest drug dealer in the world by far is the CIA. And I'm going to tell you some other information and furnish some other information, as is Bryce today, about how dirty this organization is. They're involved in international kidnapping and trafficking of children. They're involved in MK Ultra mind control program. And it goes on and on and on. And we will document this information right here in this auditorium. So I'm still working the case. We've had several hearings, appeals, We've lost them all. In entering the case, I noticed evidence is lost, stolen, destroyed, altered. One of the unusual incidents here, actually a series of three, there were three satanic signs left at the crime scene. Number one, there was unexplained feathers. There was a headless doll. And the little two-and-a-half-year-old child 
in shallow ice pick wounds, 10 of them, in her chest. S was on her chest. I asked Alina, what did that stand for? She said it stood for Satan. Well, what is this all about? That was just the beginning of my education. Then, shortly thereafter, I was asked to work a case in Nebraska with John DeCamp. And in the Nebraska case, I flew out there, worked for free, by the way. I'll make it a habit of this, but so what? Anyway, I'm helping somebody. And John asked me if I would become involved in it, and I did. The previous investigator had died in a plane crash. It was very obvious. He was murdered. He was in Chicago gathering up some evidence. He called one of John's associates, a state senator, Lauren Schmidt. He said, Lauren, I have the smoking gun. I have the evidence that will, without any question, convict these people. And I'll tell you more about the case in a minute. Got on a plane that night. The plane lasted uh, about an hour and a half out of Chicago. It blew up and fell to the ground. He and his little uh, eight-year-old son were killed, Gary Caradori. I'd like to someday go back to Lincoln and put a statue in the town square for that man. He developed a lot of information. He was a brave man, former Nebraska Highway Patrol. Anyway, from the Nebraska case, we learned that children were being driven, taken out of orphanages, private homes, Boys Town, driven from Omaha, Nebraska to Sioux City, Iowa, a distance of 184 miles away, placed in private jets, flown to Washington, D.C. for sex orgy parties with Congress and Senators. We learned that children 10, 11, 12 years old, who were part of the network, Paul Benassi in particular, was used as a decoy in shopping malls, public places, playgrounds, schoolyards, and so forth, to attract other children of the same age over to that area. Then the adults would grab the kids, throw them in a car, and be off with them. Now, what were they doing with these kids when they were flying them to Washington, D.C.? They had a condominium. Larry King, he's not uh, Larry King live television, but a black man who was a rising star in the Republican Party. He had a condominium, paid $5,000 a month. It was on Embassy Row. His salary was $17,000 a year. And these kids were being used for sex orgy parties with congressmen, senators, ambassadors, and what have you. It was basically to frame them. Another phase of the Nebraska case involved uh, what we, I later learned to be MK Ultra mind control program. And Bryce would talk a lot more about it herself. And these kids, many of them, were being taken to Offutt Air Force Base, SAC headquarters there in Omaha, tortured, put through drug programs, hypnotized, and victimized as MK Ultra victims. The CIA mind control program, as I said. Who was involved? Chief of Police Bob Wadman, Harold Anderson, past publisher of the Omaha World Herald, society editor of the Omaha World Herald, prominent people, some of those prominent people in the community. What happened in the case? Cover up. There were 80 children initially came forward. Of the 84, were able to talk and give statements, two later recanted under threats. And as I said, this involved, among other things, kidnapping, murder, satanic ceremonies, MK Ultra program. People have said, claim that there's nothing to this MK Ultra program. It's difficult to believe. But I have some material which I'd be glad to share with you. This is an item that's available through my research. It's right out of the Library of Congress, obtained through the Freedom of Information, actual government memoranda as to the MK Ultra Mind Control Program. Next. This is a obituary of Sidney Gottlieb. And if you can read right there, he talks about the, being the founder of the MK Ultra Mind Control Program. The next picture of Dr. Jolly West, psychiatrist. By the way, he died in January, and Sidney Gottlieb died in March, I believe. And he talks about, or this article talks about his involvement in drugs and cults and the mind control program. Anyway, this is an outgrowth 
of what I ran across. Put the next slide on. Just some of the, uh, just some of the documentation involved. This is an article out of the Washington Times. Top Japanese politician linked to Spence. Craig Spence was a CIA agent who was used to set these uh, ambassadors and uh, public officials up. Next. Homosexual prostitution probe and snarled the officials of Bush and Reagan administration. Washington Times also, June 29, 1989. By the way, Paul Manasseh, who is one of the main witnesses, you can keep flipping him, in the case, Paul Manasseh has drawn the inside living quarters of the White House. The public's not allowed there. Another article, power brokers serve drugs, sex at parties, bug for blackmail. Go ahead. And I talked about missing children and about kidnapped children. This is an article from the Reader's Digest, July 1982. 100,000 children disappear every year in America. This is the uh, beginning of documentation that our government is involved in kidnapping children. I'm going to show you next. Keep going with those. Excerpts from a U.S. Customs report. This report is Department of the Treasury, and in February 1987, February 5th as a matter of fact, two well-dressed men with uh, children varying in age from two to seven, six of them as I recall, were arrested in Tallahassee, Florida. From the arrest, the police traced the van up to Washington, D.C., to an organization known as the Finders. The U.S. Customs was notified, and this is the documentation from a U.S. Customs report. You can flip the page. To make uh, a long story short, uh, the Customs learned that the Metropolitan Police Department obtained search warrants, went in, and found evidence of satanic ceremonies, uh, found documentation that children were being kidnapped off the streets and exported and flown around the world, London, Germany, to the Far East, in the Middle East. And this is, as I said, the report. Uh, go back to that last page that you had on there. I want to read it to the audience. Turn it around and over. <laughs> Okay, the uh, customs agent went back uh, to the finder's uh, address, and by the way, I've got the address of this report. This report is available. On April 2nd, 87, for a final evaluation of the situation, you've been talking to Detective Bradley. Bradley was not available on that occasion. So there was a third party, and here's what he was advised, that all of the passport data had been uh, turned over to the State Department for their investigation. They found passports in the cars which indicated that the individuals at the finders had traveled to North Korea and uh, also to uh, Russia, illegal at that time during the 50s, of course. The State Department, in turn, advised the Metropolitan Police Department that all travel and use of the passports by the holders of the passports was within the law. No action would be taken. As I say, this included Traveled North Korea, North Vietnam in the late 50s and mid 1970s was illegal. The individual further advised me of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the activity of the finders had become a CIA internal matter. The Metropolitan Police Department report had been classified secret and was not available for review. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior, and that the FBI Foreign Counterintelligence Division, that's in headquarters, had directed the Metropolitan Police Department not to advise the FBI Washington Field Office, that's the investigative field office in Washington, D.C., of anything that had transpired. No further information will be available. No further action will be taken. Case closed. In researching the finders, I learned that it had been a covert CIA operation since the early 1960s. Their main mission 
was to kidnap and transport these children around the world. You can just uh, go on, keep going. I don't, you can, that, I've gone through that whole report. As another case that I worked was the McMartin case. The McMartin case broke in the early 1980s. The children claimed uh, that uh, after they were dropped off by their parents at this preschool, Manhattan Beach, California, they were involved in various ceremonies, including uh, ceremonies in a chamber underneath the school. They claimed there were tunnels under the school. They claimed they were molested under the school. They claimed there were uh, children that were sacrificed. Uh, the satanic type ceremonies, adults in robes chanting without any clothes underneath them, candles, the whole nine yards. The authorities went out in 1987, excuse me, 1985, claimed they looked for evidence of the tunnels. The kids said, in addition to the tunnels, that they were flown up into the mountains, Crestline in particular, uh, or at least two of the mountains, they didn't name Crestline, they were too young to know the difference, by jet airplanes. Uh, and um, so I did some checking on my own. You can flip it. So. And as a result, in the early 19, April 1991, I gained access to the property. And from ac the access, I hired archaeologist, Dr. Gary Stickle, at UCLA. He brought in a team of uh, individuals, professionals, and we dug for tunnels under the school. Whereas the authorities could not find the tunnels and subsequently stated that the children were hallucinating, there's nothing to it, the, uh, we found the tunnels ourselves. And uh, this is, uh, these are, Sue, I think we're kind of out of order there. Can you kind of watch me and we can, Sue? I mean, Bryce, can you kind of watch me because Huh? Well, they were in order. Okay, this is an example of the school. We went out and dug it up and went down and looked uh, into the cross of the dirt. What happens is when you go uh, take a cross section straight down, you can see foreign dirt that had been filled into the tunnels. Keep going, Sue. That's the entrance of the tunnel under the Dog West classroom. Keep going, Sue. Now, the interesting fact here is that these uh, avocado roots were live. There was a dead avocado root over here, which meant that the entrance of the tunnel, there was a nine-foot entrance that had been cut as so. Keep going, Sue. Upside down. Other way. Yeah, keep going. Other way. That was the concrete, oh, I keep going around. That's it. That was the arch between classroom three and classroom four, it was actually the arch, and that was the tunnel that went through there. This was a pentagram that we found on the plate in the uh, sandbox. We found this Disney bag, plastic Disney bag, copyright 1982, 1983, in the entrance of the tunnel, actually under the foundation so it could not have been placed there in 1966 when the building was built. It had to be in place there sometime subsequent to 1982. The tunnel's been filled in. Keep going, Sue. This is the live avocado root that I mentioned to you a few moments ago and some more. And this is a diagram of the tunnel entrance. There's the live avocado root. There's a dead one. And that was as I said, about nine feet across. Another diagram, that's where we found the uh, plastic Disney bag right there. Keep, keep going. And that's the diagram of the school. Uh, there is the west entrance that I sh showed you just a few moments ago. That's the chamber. The tunnel went across the fourth classroom, the third classroom. We didn't have time to explore it further. We ran out of money and also time. We were kicked off the lot, actually. There's a tunnel here. 
The children claimed that they were taken up into the triplex of the uh, next door, the bathroom of the triplex. There was a trap door there and uh, taken out into the community and prostituted. We found that the, the trap door in the bathroom of the triplex next door. Keep going, sir. They keep going. Um, the kids said that they were taken up into the mountains, flown up into the mountains. Um, I had an informant that told me that she had an idea of where the children were taken, abandoned satanic site now, by the way, and this was up in Crestline. These are pictures of the site. It was built on the side of the mountain. Just keep going, sir. Um, it was impossible to see it from the street. You could only see it from down below, and uh, it didn't mean anything because it was so many miles away, or from a helicopter or an airplane. You can see the massive size of it. The uh, street was over on the other, the top there, so anybody driving down the street could not have seen what was going on down here. This is, uh, I'm sure, where the cer some of the ceremonies were taking place of the kids who were flown up there. Keep going. That's probably, I don't know what that is. That's about, I think it's about nine feet across. What would that be, sir? Altar? This is uh, this down in there. It's where the site is. This would be where the street is, so you can see you couldn't see it. Keep going. That's probably uh, that was an altar we think that was broken, a uh, big stone. Six six six. That was carved in one of the rocks. That was a large circle with all kinds of writing. I couldn't get up high enough to uh, take it all in and get it all on, on one picture, a series of pictures. That was in the dungeon. Um, they had a dungeon with a drop hole. The hole was probably about uh, two and a half by three feet, and it was about 10 feet down. It was below the surface. Uh, the ceiling was about probably about eight feet high. I think that's where they killed their captives before they sacrificed them. Some ovens that were on the property. Uh, this is a sign, and you can take the next slide and put it over, overlay it on top of it. And can you see it there? Oh, turn it around. Turn the overlay around. Yeah, that's it. And this is uh, one of the uh, one of the signs that was there. Can you read that up there, Sue? Yeah, read it out loud. It was a seal of one of the satanic signs. Go ahead, take, take the next one. And put the overlay on top of it. Uh, Arma's Day. Okay, that's all right, go on to the next slide. more um, of the site. This is looking over the edge. Uh, this would have been where the abandoned satanic site was. Over the edge you can see that there's no way that you could see it from down below. This is the road that goes in down to San Bernardino. These are the eight basic uh, satanic holidays. We see we have one coming up Halloween very shortly, which is celebrate the, the dead. And the next calendar is a more detailed list of the holidays, satanic holidays during the year. You flip them over real fast. It tells uh, in detail about uh, the purpose of each holiday, sexual climax and so forth, blood and so forth. Okay. Now, during the McMartin case, at the time that it broke, I called the U.S. attorney, not the U.S. attorney, but the district attorney, and I told him, I talked to Leo Rubin, who was the prosecutor, I said, I think I know where the children were taken up in the mountains, and I'd be glad to take you up there. 
and maybe have the children go, just turn it off a minute. Have the children go up and maybe they can identify it. She said she wasn't interested. Uh, during the second trial, the first trial, Ray Bucky had a hung jury. The second trial, we discovered the tunnels under the school. I called the district attorney. They came out, a fellow named Perez, an investigator, said he wasn't interested. There weren't tunnels there. He wanted to argue with the archaeologists. They could have used the tunnels in the second trial. They didn't. Why? The children identified an actor, household name politicians, professional baseball players, professional football players. In my opinion, it was a major cover-up. Okay, so you can turn it on. So what's, what's going on in America today and around the world? Well, we're talking about a major cover-up. We're talking about control of the media. This is from the Congressional Record, 1915, February 9th, 1917, actually, not 1915. Okay, flip it. And that's a continuation of page two, Congressional Record. Uh, February the 9th, 1917. Okay, go ahead and put the next one. We're going to read it, a little bit of it here. Uh, on this particular page, Mr. Callaway, a congressman from Pennsylvania, was talking to the House of Representatives, and he pointed out that in March 1915, the J.P. Morgan interests bought up 25 of America's leading newspapers, inserted their own editors, and thereafter controlled to the best of their ability the news that was being placed in those 25 newspapers. Flip it. That's a continuation of page two, page 2948. Okay, Sue, keep going. Uh, who's who of the elite members of the Bilderbergs Council on Foreign Relations Trilateral Commission Skull and Bone Society Committee of 300? You want to know why they control and how they control it? This will give you the list. This is a book written by Robert Galen Ross. Flip it. This gives you a list of the various organizations that have members at the very top level. You see here, uh, magazine publications, Time Magazine has six, Newsweek four, New Yorker three, and so on down, total 46. Uh, we also have uh, federal government in here and so forth. Flip it. Is the Illuminati alive and well today? Well, <clears throat> you're not going to find out from checking with the mainstream media, but here's a little article that I found in the Picayune, Mississippi newspaper, and it says a group of Illuminati, including top uh, and experts in a range of fields, met, and some of the names there are their household names, including Newt Gingrich, Bill Gates, and others. So there you go right there. You didn't see that in your main LA Times or the New York Times, did you? Okay. I, I mentioned that I've been involved in this research for 20 years. And up until <clears throat> about three, two or three years ago, I used the term loose knit uh, satanic cult drug network. It was only after one of my lectures in uh, Las Vegas, I talked about the McDonald case itself. And a man came up and handed me this book, Pawns in the Game. This explains what's going on in America today. We're talking about the Illuminati. Flip it soon. This is the best documentation I've ever seen of the Illuminati. It talks about Adam Weishaupt and how he, um, well, that's, we're getting off the subject now. Just, yeah. Talks about Adam Weishaupt, how he set up 25 goals, and some of the goals were to control the press, and other goals were to disrupt the youth through drugs and liquor and morals, to have agent, to agent tour, agent uh, within the various organizations, influencing the politicians, and so forth. And there are 25 goals in this book. It's an outstanding book. I highly recommend that you obtain copies of it. Beg your pardon? William Guy Carr, and it's available through my research. And by the way, uh, I've got about 100 handouts here. I urge all of you to come up and take one if you haven't done so thus far. 
Um, basically, uh, I think that's the extent of my 45 minutes. And but before I close, let me mention that about 12, 14 years ago, um, I ran across a young musician, Mark Wilson. Had a lot of talent, has a lot of talent today. And um, as a matter of fact, I supported him financially and supported him in other ways. He actually lived uh, in the same complex as I lived at, uh, in Las Vegas. I uh, alerted him to the problems that we have with the children, kidnapped children on a regular basis. And uh, he became inspired. And he wrote a song in my living room called Rescue Me. Mark, in the meantime, just recently had his first album released. He's on the top 10 records in a number of radio stations around the country. This album is available to you. If you want to order it, you can drop a check off for $12 up here after the show today. And uh, I'll get it to you. Name and address or just leave it, write me a check and I'll return the, uh, I'll send the uh, CD or the record to your address. Um, one tenth of the proceeds of this uh, CD will go to a trust called Missing Children Trust. And we're going to set up a real organization to look for the missing children. Now, you're going to tell me that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children doesn't look for children? The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is a joke. It's a part of the Department of Justice being financed uh, through the Department of Justice. They have a multi-million dollar budget. They have a staff of, who knows, 20, 30 people. I've been in their office. They have found through the years, and I've known for them to be in existence at least 20 years, I think 95 or 96 children. You give me that money, and I'll tell you what, I'll find 95, 96 children in one month. You remember? <clears throat> Thank you, sir. You remember they used to put the kids' pictures on the milk cartons? And they took them off? I contend, I don't know, I can't tell you why. I contend too many kids were being located through those milk cartons. Your federal government doesn't want you to find these kids. Because your federal government, particularly the finders, the CIA organization out of Washington, D.C., is the biggest motivating factor behind the missing children in this country today. Why? Well, there's several reasons. <clears throat> Kids are used for body parts, sex slaves. Um, they're used for the satanic ceremonies. And a 10, 11, 12-year-old blue-eyed, blonde-haired kid will sell on the auction block outside Las Vegas, outside Toronto, Canada, and a barn in Lincoln, Nebraska. These are the three locations I'm aware of for $50,000. Paul Benassi, a young man who was willing to come forward on the Nebraska case, has attended these auctions. He attended six such auctions in Las Vegas, Nevada. The fewest number of children there were six. The most highest number were 36. The auctions took place near a landing strip. Foreigners came in with turbans on and took these kids, put them in the plane, put them in campers, who knows what, where they went from there. 100,000 children disappear. I have personally filed com formal complaints to the great FBI about the finders being an organized international child kidnapping ring. They have yet to come out and interview me formally and get my documentation, which as I pointed out to you is a U.S. Customs report. <clears throat> now the great FBI they can tell you how many bank robberies, how many kidnappings, quote, end quote, their kidnapping figures, how many cars were stolen last year, and what have you. They claim in the kidnapping department 75 to 80 children a year. That's a joke. They can keep track of cars, they can keep track of bank robberies, aggravated assaults, but they don't keep track of how many kids disappear every year. And that's by design. Anyway, Mark Wilson became inspired having made the mistake of hanging around me for too long. And he wrote this song in the living room, my, my living room, 
And I think this song, we're, we're promoting it. We, I think this song is going to go. Now, what I'd like to have you folks do, get this CD. You can order it today, $12. Actually, normally it sells shipping and handling, $15. And take it and call your radio station and tell your radio station you want them to play this song. It's called Rescue Me. Let's, let's get it. All right. 
I would like to reintroduce Mr. Ted Gunderson, and he is going to say a few words about our next speaker. And he knows her much better than I do, so he can tell you a lot more about her. Ted. You know, when you become involved in these issues, as I said earlier, you network. And um, that's one of the great pleasures that I have. It causes a few headaches now and then also, but uh, I think that's the answer to the problem, if we can all network together and help each other. And uh, a number of years ago, I guess about four or five years ago, I had a call from a young lady, and she basically uh, told me that she had some problems, and I referred her to uh, another individual who I thought would help her. And um, one thing led to another, and then I developed a close relationship with this young lady through the years. We communicated by telephone on a regular basis, and um, she's fantastic. She's really fantastic, and I wanted to make sure that I was the one who introduced her today. I asked if I couldn't introduce her today because of the work that she's done. I, of all the people in this field, I think she's probably done as much or more than anybody that I'm aware of or know of. And, um, and of course, that young lady is Bryce Taylor. And she's, fan she's a great person, she's a dear friend, and even if she doesn't know how to flip the overheads, I still love her. <laughs> But I'm going to flip her overhead, so I'm going to get even with you. <laughs> anyway, let me introduce to you Bryce Taylor. And she's, just give her a big hand. She's very special. Just to let everybody know, um, it wasn't really five years ago. It was more like almost 12. It's been a long time. Um, but time goes by fast these days. And this is an incredible opportunity um, for me to be here back in Pasadena, where my home was here in California. And I owe this privilege to Annie Basile the owner of Cass Locations, and she keeps telling me to stop thanking her, but I really can't stop thanking this woman because she has stepped forward and supported this whole issue in such an incredible, heartfelt way of taking care of the details and being there emotionally for not only myself, but all the people, all the other victims and survivors who have come forward and uh, are joining now in a way that hasn't happened in a very long time. And so, Annie, I would just like to thank you. And like to thank all of Annie's friends, Patricia and Anthony and her family, um, both Anthony's and her daughter, and all the people that have really worked behind the scenes to bring this whole event together, um, as well as holding the hands of a lot of us who've been through this and, and needed to share. Um, when the press release went out saying the Holly Hollywood business owner supports mind control survivor, it was just an incredible healing for not only myself, but all of us that have been through this as people now um, not only take us serious for what all we've been through, but also are willing to step forward in an in effort to end these atrocities that have gone on behind everyone's backs. So um, I am just very grateful that she brought me here today to share with you the truth of what is occurring in this country and in the world in hopes that together we all might be able to expose and end these crimes that are being committed against children all over the world. Um, and I will share today with you my truth 
as I know it, so help me God. And so I just wanted to say that I am I'm grateful for the healing that I was able to um, come up with, which seems at times to be miraculous coming from, from where I've been. And I owe that in a, a great deal, that uh, gratefulness to the Holy Spirit and to the God that has led and guided me through this whole entire thing to bring me here now. And it is kind of um, pretty an amazing thing that I'm speaking in Pasadena where um, nearly 12 years ago I was in a therapy group here for people that had multiple personality disorder. And as part of a prayer, an opening prayer for the group, one of the women prayed, Dear God, please help one of us heal enough that we will be able to, that th this person will be able to go out and get help for all of us. And when that prayer was said, my whole body just kind of turned into little chill bumps and I knew but way back then that that would be me. And so it's, um, it's pretty awesome to be here in Pasadena fulfilling the, um, that prayer and knowing that it has been answered. I also want to thank Ted Gunderson who, um, even though he thinks it was only five years ago, uh, <laughs> about 12 or 13 years ago he began uh, consulting with me by phone along with Catherine Gould and giving me tips on how to stay safe and what to do when I, men in suits were following me and, and uh, he just was there for my security and to listen and, and to lend a, a caring, supportive uh, hand. And I'm, I'm really appreciative to him for all that he has done in exposing the satanic ritual abuse and the mind control that's gone on. So thank you, Ted. You missed the thank you. <laughs> And I'd also like to thank the LA Women's um, Commission Task Force on Ritual Abuse that's still in operation today. That were, uh, when I was living here in California, I was a member as was Ted, and, and together we worked to strategize on how to, uh, first of all, be able to um, identify what the problems were of all these people, children, uh, women, and men coming up with all these memories and then what to do about it. So I'd just like to say that that organization is still in operation today and, and there's still a core group of dedicated people working with that. Should you want some further information, there's a booklet up at the table. Um, I'm also a member of the ISSD, which is the Study of Dissociation Group, um, and NASA. Uh, Claire Reeves is here today, Mothers Against Sexual Abuse, and I'd like to just tell a little story on Claire. Um, the first time I met Claire was, I don't know, how long ago was that? Probably <laughs> about eight years. Anyway, she, it was one of her debuts for her organization. She was speaking, and um, during the break I took her aside and started downloading all this government information of all the stuff that I'd been involved with, with the presidents and Henry Kissinger and Bob Hope. And she was smoking a cigarette, and she, she was so nervous that it, she picked up another one, and she was smoking two cigarettes at once. So uh, the stress has definitely uh, been there, and, and Clarice has been a person who has stayed in the battle, and so I just want to thank her and, and to acknowledge all of the wonderful work that she's doing. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Brian Devereaux and Arizona Wilder who are now really coming together to um, support survivors and to, as Brian is so adeptly informed about a lot of the mind control history and how a lot of this Illuminati and New World Order um, agenda has begun in Arizona, who is um, really standing forward and speaking out about what she knows and what she saw at the top. It's going to take all of us speaking together um, as our little pieces of what we were involved with all fit together to really actually make the bigger picture of what has been hidden from society all these years. So I just want to thank Arizona and Brian. And I'd like to um, thank Lynn Ma Sharman who started a, um, it's an advocacy committee for mind control survivors called AICS Mind Control. And Patty Wren is here today as 
the United States representative of that organization. And I feel honored to be able to be the spokesperson for this group of uh, dedicated women who have uh, really documented, compiled survivor data in ways that has allowed for the research to continue and for us to be able to identify the programmers and the programming sites and the places that are most heavily involved. And so there's information up at the table about AIDS mind control and I would urge you all to pick up a flyer. And there's also a booklet that's pretty awesome that has a lot of the pictures of uh, programmers that have been identified. It's right here on the table, so you might want to look at that at the break. It's uh, pretty revealing. Um, and I would like to thank all of the people who have gone before. Many of the survivors that I was in group with are, are no longer living. Uh, the stress or whatever happened, they, many of them didn't make it. Um, and a lot of the people that in the, in the earlier days, it was, it was quite a danger to be speaking out. Um, in today's world, there, there are more people who have come out and talked about this, and so the danger and the risk to all of us is much less. I used to have men following me in cars with guns, and all kinds of um, hideous things were happening. And I won't say that that's all stopped, but I'll say it's certainly got a, a lot better as, as we all um, speak out. And uh, I would like to dedicate my presentation today to my daughter, Kelly, who is 21 years old. And due to the intergenerational nature of the Mind Control Project, Kelly was born into a family where she continued to be abused just like I was. And so right now, um, Kelly is in a mental hospital. And so I would just ask all of you to please keep her in your prayers and to know that uh, we have certainly not educated the psychiatric community or people in the hospitals or the prison systems enough. And that there are so many people who are never going to get free or be able to recover unless this information is taken out and people begin to be educated about what this all means. Um, her psychiatrist at this hospital maintains that DID, which if you all know is Dissociative Identities Disorder, which is the, the new name that was come up with for Multiple Personality Disorder, and he maintains that it's a rare disorder, and I maintain that it's, it's absolutely very prolific, and that until people really can see what the problem is, the solution is not even in sight. And so um, there's just a lot of education that needs to be done uh, still, and a lot of information shared. And so to begin my talk, I'd like to state for the first time, uh, it's a little scary, especially in California, that my real name is Susan Ford and that my Bryce Taylor was a name that I took in an effort and an attempt to create safety for myself and for my children and all of the people that were connected with me as I ran and um, began writing, as Catherine Gould suggested years ago, uh, that I began writing what happened so that as I became more public, I would be safer. And that certainly has been the case. So um, safety, uh, our safety all lies in, in telling the truth now and in identifying what we know to be the truth. Because as the title of my book is, that this truth is not only a truth that set me free, this is a truth that as all of us that have been through this begin to put in our data, it's a truth that sets the world free of a plan set in motion very, very long time ago by members of the Illuminati and even beyond them for uh, what I was part and privy to was their attempt to uh, create and rule a one world government or as Hitler called the New World Order and George Bush called the New World Order. 
And it's through my experience with Henry Kissinger and others that, that I am very sure, and I will stand anywhere and testify that I know that this real, that the New World Order agenda is very real and that um, it's going to take a lot of our efforts to turn it around and to maintain our freedoms. Today, unlike the days when I was in my therapy groups with people who were switching personalities all over the place, um, I've worked very hard and I'm now an integrated survivor of intergenerational satanic ritual abuse and also the CIA's MK Ultra, and what I understand is called, the subproject was called Project Monarch. Um, I'm the author of three books now, Starshine, One Woman's Valiant Escape from Mind Control was the novel that I wrote starting in 1991 when I fled California and was attempting to uh, discover what was the problem and why everybody was so interested men in suits, why they even cared uh, where I was going to therapy or, or who I was talking to. And so through that book, um, I was able to put the bigger picture together for myself and, and novelize it so that people could really understand what, what I was trying to talk about. I've also written another booklet. It's called Revivification. And uh, Charles Whitfield said to me one day, he said, one day you're going to regret that you named it that name, and sometimes I am because it's kind of a big word and it's hard to say, but it has a really great meaning, and um, if you want to look at that book, it's, it's on a table, but it's a, it's a, a recovery, gentle alternative recovery uh, book for people that have been through trauma, so it's a good way to recover memory and to uh, be able to deal with all of that as it comes up. And then, my uh, third book is Thanks for the Memories, and that book I started years ago, actually, and it is a compilation of all of my memories that I downloaded out of uh, what Henry Kissinger called my mind files. And so that, the book that I wrote is uh, just loaded with all of the information that I remembered being privy to within those uh, seeking to bring in the New World Order. So I uh, find it a privilege and an honor to be able to speak out for people like my daughter and my other children and those who are yet unable to speak out for themselves but have also been through the same thing. Normally the groups that I speak to are mental health professionals and so we're kind of on the same page and I really know uh, exactly what they're going to need to hear in order to help the victims and survivors that they're working with, but I know that we have a wide and varied audience here, and um, it's really very exciting to know that what I always call so-called uh, normal people, like, I get Annie, you're normal, that um, people that are not been through this are normal, and so it's really exciting to have normal people um, pay attention and want to know, and um, I would just like to say to the survivors in the audience that I thank you for being here to support me today and that um, I would like to ask you to really take caution um, that some of the material that I'm going to present may be highly triggering and that I know that you know how to take care of yourselves. And if you don't, go see Annie. <laughs> Annie's, Annie can hold you, no. Um, there's a lot of people here who uh, could support you, and if, if you need help, then certainly uh, seek out Annie and she'll direct you. Um, I agonized on how I would present this material to you so that you could really understand what um, has taken most people uh, a number of years to, as they've reached or researched, to understand really what this the bigger picture is here. and. Um, and I know that it's vitally important today, and I feel an urgency of time that we don't really have a lot of time to be uh, wasting here, that the plan that has been set in motion is ever um, marching onward, and yet so are all of us who are dedicated to preserving the, 
the uh, freedom of humanity and especially the freedom of the mind. And it's vitally important to free the, those many suffering under mind control and expose the system that has allowed this to uh, proliferate and also to expose those individuals participating at the top that has operated in the dark for, for so many, many hundreds of years. This system that operates within the government and beyond into a group of people who I reported to beyond the government called the council have been um, working in the dark for many years and the system that they have enacted threatens our country and the freedoms that our forefathers worked so diligently to set up and the basic freedoms of humanity and most especially of the mind. And we're at a new crossroads um, where we're able to finally understand more about the mind. And as we do that, then we will certainly be able to understand how this has all happened. And we will be able to take the technology that was used to harm and we can use it to heal. And that is, is my hope for the future. At the conclusion of the writing of the Constitution, Benjamin Franklin was asked, what have you wrought? And he answered, a republic if you can keep it. He also explained that it would require full use of our spiritual natures and, and our values in order to keep our country on track. And that was why the four founders, our forefathers founded the nation as one nation under God. And I know today that many, many people know, they feel that something is vital, vitally wrong. Even the, the children know that something is really wrong, but most people haven't been able to figure out what. And I think the reason for that will become very apparent to you, to you this evening as I share uh, what has happened in my life and in the lives of my family with you. The, bi the bigger picture that I gleaned from years of untangling this web of programming that was uh, attempting, was put in intentionally to attempt to hide uh, my use, my co covert secret use within the government as this tool of the New World Order, uh, kept me endlessly for years uh, doing artwork and journaling the details of the, the uh, lengthy and, and often very um, prevalent and seemed like it was intruding on every moment of my life, flashbacks and ab reactions of what had happened. Um, and those things came back, all of the events came back uh, in full sensory um, magnitude of feeling everything in my body, smelling the smells, um, being able to hear what happened. And oftentimes I would have visuals and be able to actually see what happened, who was involved. Um, and so uh, what happened was that this uh, programming that National Security Agency guaranteed that I would never be able to remember or tell failed. <laughs> that's the good news. Um, that's the really good news because as we all tell, uh, you all, and I'm starting to sound Southern now because I live in the South, but everybody is going to be able to know what they need to do to end and stop this. So um, it's actually in some ways a gift that all of us that have been through this are able to wake up and, and tell our uh, very personal and private experiences with world leaders and, and with people that are affluential and, and um, who've had people fooled about who they really are. Uh, it's, it's through my personal experiences with uh, Henry Kissinger and, and Bob Hope, who was my owner, that I am very aware that our, not only our country, but that our world is way off course. And that, um, in essence, is in not only humanity, but also the planet is in, in very serious jeopardy. And for things that we value, I've found that it's going to take our care and attention in order to be able to bring this back into the right alignment. 
In the next um, hour, I'm going to share with you many of the top secret and, and many of the still classified projects that were hidden and tucked neatly away from public scrutiny by so-called national security and within my own mind in these so-called mind files. And these events that I witnessed are contributing to the loss of freedoms uh, of our country and of the citizens of the United States and the world. And they allow for the intentional torture of children to be used as a non-paid slave labor force. And this isn't just a handful of children from California or from Nebraska. These are people all over the world. And I personally interact with many of them and hear their testimonies and what's happened to them. And there is no doubt in my mind that this is a very large plan. Their plan is for the mind control slaves to continue to serve the elite and everyone except the self, these self-appointed elite will uh, begin to live as worker bees. Um, so basically, uh, as we enter the new millennium, uh, a lot of us that were and are under mind control will continue to do their jobs to serve these elite people. And with all of the targeted frequency um, satellites and all of the ways that they know how to manipulate uh, brain waves through that targeted energy, um, they have some plans for all of you to only be able to think to a certain level. And um, to understand all this, it's, and to help Kelly, it really drove me into studying all about the brain, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but uh, that is their plan. And the way that they have been able to um, utilize all of these children, starting with children and now into adults, is through trauma. And trauma, it's, trauma is the conditioning base that was used to set in the mind control. And the trauma done very early on is something that actually splits and shatters the psyche of a small child who is unable to withstand that much torture or trauma at a satanic ritual or through sexual abuse uh, in family or whatever the um, list of all the different traumas. What happens is that when that happens, the mind splits into different segments and it's sort of understanding all of this really demystifies all of the sensationalism that has been publicly portrayed about uh, multiple personality disorder and I will explain to you that through not only healing my own mind of that but working with other survivors that it's um, merely something that has happened out of someone not being able to take everything that was dished out and so it's like the mind uh, erects amnesic barriers around information and different scenarios so that uh, as a protection when that thing happens again, that event, then the person will, will kind of go down that path in their mind. And the programmers knew all about this. This was not some happenstance um, programming that just was, was done in some kind of an experiment, although the experiments were ongoing. And as many of you already know, and those of you that don't know, um, during uh, Nazi Germany, during the war, when all these people were in the concentration camps, we had uh, people like Joseph Mengele and many of the Nazi doctors and scientists were actually doing mind experiments and brain experiments on people in the concentration camps. And all it took for me was to go to the Holocaust Museum in DC and look at the pictures. And I knew that that was true uh, as I watched the people being um, experimented on with uh, all this brain research that they were doing. And the information that these Nazi doctors gleaned in the, the concentration camps was what has been the foundation for what they're doing here today in our country. And for you to understand how that has all happened, um, our government, actually the CIA, 
flew a lot of these doctors, the uh, perpetrators, after the Nuremberg trials, instead of being prosecuted, they were given immunization from prosecution. And our CIA uh, actually flew these Nazi doctors to our country and gave them immunity and set them up with research grants and all sorts of uh, mega funding in our universities and military bases. And they continued their, not only their further research on the mind, but they also continued um, their uh, expertise on programming people within the military, within NASA, um, people that are out of the private sector, like myself, um, where I was certainly not part of the military or any intelligence group, but because of the intergenerational nature of the group of people that they needed the population to use, um, I believe that I was selected. And so we have now civilians being taken without their knowledge and awareness, not only to major universities, but also to uh, military bases around the country and the world, where they are put under mind control with very sophisticated technology that I will get into more later. So, um, you know, I'm sure you're asking, you know, how did I wake up? How did I know about this? And um, I began to wake up in 1985. Up until that time, I thought that I had an incredible family. I thought I had the best family in the world. Um, certainly, we had just about everything that I needed. And, and um, then when I married, I had a wonderful husband and beautiful children and anything money could buy. I lived in a, a beautiful neighborhood um, in Agora Hills, and which was located uh, just a block from Bob Hope's ranch. Uh, as we were strategically located, but during all this time, I thought I had a very perfect life, and I had no idea I'd ever been abused. And to let you know how it feels to be under mind control and hear about ritual abuse and mind control, I can share my experience um, where I was attending Pepperdine University working on my degree in psychology, and I attended an international psych conference where Catherine Gould, who as many of you know is a therapist who's worked with uh, ritual abuse DID patients for a very long time. And I went to one of her lectures, and I sat in a room, and you know, I was just puzzled of you know, why people would do this. Why would people be hurting their own children, and why would, um, why would all the prominent people in the communities be involved and, you know, what is all this horror? And I remember walking out of, of her workshop thinking, well, I hope, hope, I sure hope I don't get any cases like that when I'm a therapist. And that was the end of it for about three years. Um, I actually even um, joined the LA Women's Task Force and attended meetings under total mind control where I didn't know, but I was reporting back to uh, the good doctors, everything that I was uh, learning what was happening. But um, anyway, so that's how it felt. I had no idea. And, um, but in 1987, after, or 1985 actually, after a lot of prayer, I started praying real heavily because I, I knew something was wrong. I just couldn't kind of figure it out. But I did know something was wrong. So I kept praying for God to please help me. and. It helped me decide what was wrong and why I felt so unhappy, even though I had everything that money could buy, and everything that um, was supposed to make people happy, beautiful kids, and like I told you, my family. And, um, but the answer to that prayer came in the form of a kind of a massive wake-up call. And my head went through the windshield of the automobile there on Chesborough Road in, in Agora Hills, and. Um, what happened was that accident um, really kind of took me out of my motherly role and all my duties that I had. And I really had to take time to recuperate, and I had a lot of massage therapy. And um, what began to emerge were memories of being sexually abused. 
and then um, came memories of uh, ritual abuse. And at that time, I was uh, in school at a college called RioCon, and I was working towards my master's degree to be a clinical psychologist. And I, um, I still had no idea really what, what this all meant, but all I knew was that my memories now began flooding in to the extent that it was either continue on with school and put my past behind me like everybody kept telling me, just you know, let the past go, or just live in the present, or um, enter therapy full time. And so I entered what I now understand was the true master's program, which was a personal uh, journey of believing and understanding and exploring my own inner space and really going within. I learned to uh, meditate. I uh, began not only doing yoga but teaching yoga and um, and I was in therapy increasing amounts of time as I was having a really hard time dealing with what all this was and um, as I would begin remembering I would have my suicide programs would kick in and I would call my therapist um, both of them endlessly telling them I, I had to kill myself and I wanted to jump out of buildings uh, hotels, jump out of the windows, and uh, when the memories began really th threatening and emerging even more, I would cut and burn my arms in an attempt that I would um, do my, what my programming was commanding, and it was an attempt, a very sophisticated attempt, to uh, take my attention away from what was really coming up in the form of national security memories, and uh, certainly by cutting myself, that would make me have to focus on something else. But um, I'm sure that the reason that Henry Kissinger and others picked me was not because I was stupid. And although in those days I felt, um, as they had created, I felt really ugly and I felt stupid. But I was able to figure out pretty quickly that um, this was programming and this was something that I, needed to figure out how to get around. And so as I began working in therapy with all of the ritual abuse, the systematic abuse that happens to children, um, the endless tortures that kids report all over the country that I don't think I need to go into all the gory details, but it all happened to me too. And why people sane adults would think that little children all over the world would be making up these kind of realities is something that I still have a really hard time understanding. And I know how painful it has been for me over the years to report what has happened and had people either turn away out of horror and disbelief or out of fear for themselves and their own lives. And I can only imagine what it must feel like to a little child to be telling what's happened and have no one believe them. And so I'm here today as an advocate for the children who have been through this. And I will tell you that the satanic ritual abuse is not some religious fanatics that are, are going off the deep end. It's very systematically and um, intentionally done as trauma conditioning to shatter the base personality so that very sophisticated equipment and programming can be laid in over that so that a person, a child, can be put under total and complete mind control and be un totally unaware of what their own reality is. So. Um, so as I was in therapy uncovering all of this, I journaled everything and I wrote and, and did artwork and I began remembering abuse by my family, by my mother and father who uh, tortured me and delivered me to uh, military bases and to all sorts of 
places for my programming. And it wasn't until I had the memories, the most painful memories that I had, were some of the last ones I had were of the ways that I also was used to torture and program, deliver my children also to military bases and places where they would also be programmed. So this system needs to be understood how it happens and why people have been involved and why they might not even know that it has happened to them. But when I started realizing that my ex-husband and I had both participated in even my own children's abuse, I began to have some compassion and understanding for my parents and for people like even the Buckies in the McMartin preschool because perhaps given the reality of understanding how this system works, perhaps they also are or were unrecovered victims who themselves may not have even remembered what they were involved with. That's the intentional way this was all set up. So as we're able to uh, really come to a higher level of understanding how this system works, we're gonna be able to bring the kids and the adults suffering still, bring them recovery and, and tools for helping. I was taken to uh, US military bases as a very small little girl um, where I was programmed and I met for the first time um, one of my father's uncles uh, in Long Beach and his name was Charles Lily Horn. And I believe it's because of my family affiliation with this man who was the owner of Federal Cartridge Company, which was a munitions manufacturer, and also the Olin Corporation, which later I believe even went on to fund some of the research used on the mind control, that I became involved in this. And so I also had my grandfather, who was a mayor in Correctionville, Iowa, and was uh, held different political positions over the years. And so through the intergenerational structure, I was actually taken back to Iowa. And I was involved in satanic rituals there at the hands of my father and my grandfather. So I was able then to understand that this was intergenerational. This is how this works. So um, a lot of the uh, projects that are now housed and are still ongoing are in the military bases. And some of the ones that I can name for you that I was taken to personally uh, are NASA bases, uh, UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute where I was um, programmed to report to Dr. Jollyon West, who was uh, working in conjunction with Henry Kissinger to um, lay in my very sophisticated uh, national security protected, they thought, programming. Uh, USC, uh, the University there of Southern California. I was taken to Beth Bethesda Naval Hospital where um, I was, had an implant inserted into my nose. Uh, I was taken to Edwards Air Force Base, um, Point Magoo Naval Weapons Center, and different bases in and around 29 Palms. And I was taken to a lot of other places, um, and still, as yet, I'm not able to identify where specifically a lot of those places are, but through like the information that's been compiled through AICS Mind Control uh, Committee, a lot of other survivors have filled in the blanks. So um, that information is available on a website, and I said you can, as I said, you can uh, pick out a brochure up here when we're finished. Uh, so what they did on these uh, military bases was they used drugs, a lot of drugs, and uh, torture of the mind and body. Uh, sensory, I was subjected to sensory deprivation chambers, uh, light and sound technology where they would flash bright lights in my eyes like um, in uh, conspiracy theory where Mel Gibson's you know, showing eyes wide open, that's all programming and that's exactly how it happens. And just as a little aside from this, 
Walter Boward, who wrote Operation Mind Control in 1978, exposed all of this. And because of the massive CIA cover-up, although his book was made a bestseller, it was bought up out of all of the bookstores by the CIA, and people weren't educated and informed about this. So it continued to go on. But um, Walter Bauer was actually one of the consultants on conspiracy theory. And so uh, that movie is not fiction, it's fact. And there's a lot of it that, that's very true for people that have been through this. Um, they often played um, different sounds in each ear, uh, some very piercing, uh, painful sounds, and in the other ear, uh, sounds that were barely inaudible. And uh, they used hypnotic technique and frequency technology coupled with electroshock. So um, it's pretty horrific stuff. And it's, uh, it's been really uh, pretty helpful uh, to expose what all of this is in an attempt to stop this. Um, I'm going to show you later pictures of my son Danny when he was taken uh, to some of these bases and it'll help you, I think, have more personal experiences of this. But all this programming was done on myself and others. And personally, for me, it was uh, done so that I could later be used by leaders as a sex slave. They called it being a presidential model. And I was programmed to wear diamonds as a program identifier to people that within the agency or within the government, then they would know who I was and what my programming was and what I was capable of. And I was also programmed to have um, what Henry Kissinger called mind files, which was a, a systematic way that he programmed lots of data into my mind that I was programmed to have, first of all, a perfect photographic memory and he would send me into uh, archives in D.C. and private offices of people he wanted to spy on and uh, into Pentagon top security uh, areas. And he would uh, tell me then with instructions to go in and open certain file drawers and photograph the information in my mind and then I would report back to Henry and any information that he would need then would be very accessible to him at a moment's notice. Other slaves have been used as assassins. Um, I was also used as a drug courier, um, make, putting together drug runs. And through all of that, I realized and was privy to knowing that our government, our United States government, is primarily backed by guns and drugs. And um, it doesn't make me very proud of our nation at all. Um, so anyway, uh, Henry also programmed me to have a section in my mind files that was a postal system for the elite. And I was sent around to world leaders and to members of the elite families in order that they could um, be delivered the messages that I had been programmed to deliver or to uh, retrieve messages or answers to questions about uh, would they cooperate. And then I would deliver the message back that I had gleaned from being flown all over the globe. I would deliver this information back to Henry. And then Henry would report to whoever he was reporting to, and that was the way that they attempted to keep this uh, planet, the New World Order, very organized. And certainly when you have a slave labor force that uh, is programmed never to make a mistake or never tell, it, it keeps things pretty organized. And so I reported to um, people like George Bush and Ronald Reagan and um, actually most all the presidents uh, I was sent in on to either give them information or um, ask them questions from the higher-ups, the council that actually was uh, head and shoulders over uh, even Henry Kissinger. And so I watched as uh, men in suits and uh, tuxedos would meet at the Rockefeller Mansion. They'd bring me in to have sex with people like um, um, Prince Philip or 
Prince Charles or someone in the Kennedy family or whatever. And after these parties at the Rockefellers, what they would do is a select group of men would meet in back rooms and they would send me in to record all the information so I could report it to whoever needed the information. And it was a, a process of downloading all of this information that I realized that all of the wars that have been fought and all of the, a lot of the horrors that have happened to people on this planet were not accidents, including like the stock market crash, that they were all planned intentionally. And people like my grandfather, who was um, a multimillionaire, was, was privy of when the stock market was going to be crashed so he could take all of his money out and reinvest it at very low prices. And so I watched from the inside to see that things are not as they have been publicly portrayed by the media and that there is a media agenda that people like Henry Kissinger and others met and decided what was the strategy going to be that they were going to then tell the media for them to report to the world. And so I watched as I saw all of this going on and I had a kind of a, a broader spectrum of reality than all of you, although it has taken me time to kind of catch up on what the world thought was reality because I wasn't allowed to really know what that was. Um, and so, anyway, that's, that was some of my government use. And I'm going to also get into that more. Uh, but I also wanted to highlight the fact that as a child, I was also used in um, massive amounts of child uh, pornography and prostitution. And that was carried on often in uh, church basements where I attended the... Uh, Woodland Hills Presbyterian Church and also St. Mel's Catholic Churches and through either those churches or uh, people that were part of the inner circle of the satanic members of those churches I was abused and then taken often like to where everyone thought I was going to choir practice and I would be excused from school and be taken to the choir director's home across the street and we would all have our little choir robes on and be singing you know, very angelically until the men arrived with the equipment. And all the equipment then was taken downstairs and all of us children knew that that meant it was time to go down and be filmed in pornography. And those were also very traumatic events because a lot of what they were filming was not just sexual acts, it was a lot of um, satanic rituals and so I can publicly testify that what these children are saying is reality and I can also say that I was used even as a child on Ventura Boulevard uh, near the Corbin Bowl to coerce children that were my age into um, black sedans where the men had um, TVs and candy and all kinds of things that I was told to lure children into the cars and they would happen to be shopping with their mom um, walking along the boulevard there and then I would say something like, um, would you like some candy? And there's a TV in the back of this car, do you want to come and see it? And as soon as this child would approach the car, the men would throw them in the back seat and take off. And then often I witnessed as these children would be kept contained in cages until it was time for their death. And that death was often brought about by, uh, through uh, being filmed in pornography and then used in snuff films. And honestly, I can't imagine that we have this many sick and perverted people in the world. But there must be quite a market for this because there are a lot of us that have reported being a part of it. And so that is where I believe many of the missing children are going to. So, um, what happened to me as, as I had these accidents in 1985, and then I had another one in 1987 on the same day, April 12th, 9.15 in the morning, both accidents, same date, same time. And that kind of got my attention. 
And I thought, there must be something really going on here. And a man in a, in a sedan showed up at one of the accident sites, took pictures and fled off. I thought, you know, this something is very strange here. But at the, in those days, I had no idea what the bigger picture was, nor did the therapists that were attempting to help me figure out what was all going on. But um, I continued on in therapy, um, reintegrating many of the child personalities that I had that were programmed within me. And it was in um, 1991, uh, it was April 10th, real close to the April 12th date again. And um, I left a therapy session with my therapist and I went to get in my car and I opened my wallet and I look inside and there was a dollar bill that had programming numbers and I had uncovered enough of my own programming to know that what this meant was it was another threat, only this accident I didn't believe was to be an accident. I believed that they were threatening to kill me. And across this dollar bill were the, uh, was the date April 12th, and then it had a series of programming numbers that corresponded to uh, different programs within me. So I was uh, terrified, and I had attempted to explain to my husband a little bit about some of these um, satanic memories, and I found that when I would talk to him about it, that he would just become very angry and so I learned not to talk to him about it. And I learned not to tell him about my, my plan that my therapist and I had, had come up with to get me out of California and onto the island of Kauai um, before April 12th. And so um, that day when, when I left my home there in Agora Hills, I had no idea that I would never be returning there to my children or my husband or the home and my family that I loved. And once I got to the island, I didn't have any money because I had to leave everything. And so I began um, using the ocean as my therapist. And I had a person came to me and gave me a light and sound machine. And I was terrified of it because that was the very thing, some of the very things that had been used to program me. And I, I thought, oh my God, what is this? But this man very patiently sat with me while I re-experienced a memory on it and found that it was much less painful to recover memory with that. And so I sat endlessly uh, recovering memories about uh, governors of California, about Pete Wilson and Reagan and Hope and Nixon and B.B. Rebozo and I mean all the people that I name in my books, the Dodgers and um, and had I not had the uh, ability to, to document all of this, I would have thought I was crazy because it didn't really make any sense until I was able later to really put together the larger picture of what this whole New World Order agenda was. And then with that, it started to make sense of why all of these people were involved. So anyway, um, Ted Gunderson and Catherine Gould kept giving me security tips, and I was running from place to place, uh, trying to stay alive and sleeping on the floors in people's homes that opened their homes to me, and uh, continued to write uh, Starshine. And then later on, over the years, the further deprogramming that I did in memory retrieval, I spent hours just sitting in a meditative state remembering and detailing all of it in writing, and that's what's in my book. So I won't be able to cover all of that, but certainly I hope to give you the bigger picture, and then with the information in my book, you'll be able to see how I was involved at even, with even more details with all of these people, including um, people like Alan Greenspan. So um, one perspective I would like to share with you is that I believe that the mind control is one of the major secret weapons of the, those people bringing in the New World Order. And as we're able to understand how this works, that's how we, we're able to go into these places where this stuff is still happening and, and demand 
information and demand that it be stopped and identify the people that are still, whether they're under mind control themselves or just um, disconnected left brain scientists, whatever it is, uh, it needs to stop. And it's definitely going to take all of us to do this. Um, how are we doing on time? I mean, like, how much longer? Okay, I wanted to explain a little bit of the, the mind control enhancements that I had. And um, one of those was, like I already told you, the photographic memory um, and the ability to store vast amounts of data for quick recall with the encoded files that Henry Kissinger um, uh, named, with code names. I was a message courier um, imputed with specific words and programmed to deliver them to um, exactly as they were programmed into people uh, all over the world. Uh, total recall of conversation with people and then be able to report it back word by word, everything that was said, including sometimes when there was rooms full of people conversing. Um, sexual expertise, I was uh, trained at training farms and by all kinds of uh, prostitutes and playboy bunnies and everything to be the perfect sex slave for Bob Hope, as was Kelly. And um, that sexual stuff is um, something that you can read about in my book. I talk about sexual encounters with all the presidents and world leaders, but um, for you to really understand that Henry Kissinger and others, they knew exactly what this, these sexual encounters were doing, that they were actually setting up a different brain function and that once after sex that when this information was then given to somebody that then they would um, be receiving it in a different brain state and it would carry more importance so it wasn't like some stupid little thing they were they were doing although um, I found that most men were uh, very um, easy to sexually manipulate and then often they were then uh, through the coercion that happened through myself and others, if they weren't already involved in the New World Order agenda, they were after that. And especially if they were pedophiles and had sex with children, like George Bush, who had sex with my daughter Kelly at a very early age, during the time he was vice president. When Reagan was president, I was prostituted to him, and Kelly was prostituted to the vice president. And so whether these people are themselves under mind control, or not, it needs to be exposed and stopped. I mean, this is, this is uh, just horrific. I was programmed, uh, as was Kelly, as a long distance swimming without tiring so that I could uh, swim between ships, passing information about drug runs or uh, to meet council members or some of these men uh, that are puppeting the world out in the middle of the ocean um, at very strategic locations where then I would, um, listen to their in instructions or the information and report it back to those who needed to know. I was involved in a lot of parapsychology and psychic research and remote viewing and telepathic communication studies and experiments. And uh, although the government often makes fun of psychic ability, uh, believe me, way back when, years ago, they were using all of this psych psychic technology with all of us. Uh, remote, remote viewing and asking us what, what are they doing in this country, what is this person doing, and um, also the telepathic communication where when people wouldn't give me information, I got it anyway because I could read their minds. And so a lot of this is um, technology that most all slaves have and um, these uh, programming things can be put in place with uh, all of the methods that I told you about before. Um, so Bob Hope would have parties and they would bring in lots of sex slaves and, and they would keep people like my children in back rooms for people that Henry called uh, people with alternate sexual preference. And what this means is that they were pedophiles. And so whatever it was they wanted, if it was sex with kids, if it was drugs, uh, alcohol, uh, whatever it was, these people were brought into Bob's parties and they had all, all you, already
carefully researched Bob and Henry, everything that they would need to know about different people that they then invited to the parties in order to enlist them further in the New World Order agenda. So I was a part of it, those parties compromising, manipulating, and targeting people as I was programmed. Politicians, uh, presidents, entertainers, judges, foreign ambassadors, leaders all over, um, just through the sex and, um, and through all the different uh, things that I was programmed to do with them. Um, I also was privy to uh, a lot of the uh, projects, the mind control projects that were being done at USC. My ex-husband was uh, in dental school there and I was not only prostituted to people in position of authority at USC, but I was also um, taken into some of the programming centers there and programmed and I also delivered, um, like I'm standing here today, only now I have my own agenda, but Henry, Henry would often have me demonstrating the mind control technology to people who um, they wanted or needed to know about that. And the way they got to know was through a series of meetings. If they were continued to cooperate and not be horrified by what they were hearing slowly, they got bumped up to larger levels of this top security and classified project. So, I witnessed a lot of that at um, USC. And I also witnessed um, as a child and, a, and a, as adult that uh, a lot of this New World agenda is fueled by the secret societies. Um, and the ones that I was abused by were the Shriners and also the, the Masonic Order uh, people are reporting Masonic abuse um, and uh, by 33rd degree Masons and most all of our presidents um, for your information were 33rd degree Masons and that makes them privy to this mind control information. This is the secret that they rise through the ranks to learn about and at the top what they participate in as a seal of their oath of secrecy is often satanic ritual and myself and others were laid on altars and raped and uh, this happened as a child and as an adult. So um, this is part of uh, how it continues. The, there are hand signals, the, the Shriners and the Masons at the top have hand signals where they signal each other and alert brothers so that they can um, have full cooperation. And even, this even happens in court cases where children are um, the uh, non-offending parents trying to get a child into the safety and of uh, their home and uh, a Masonic judge or a Masonic attorney will give a hand signal or do the, the little things and that child is, uh, the whole case is dropped and the child is left with the perpetrator. So these things are real and um, they're, they're still happening today. Henry's strategy uh, that I heard him talk about with Nelson Rockefeller was about hiding this all out in the open. And they talked about how the bigger secrets were protected by their incredulity. And certainly all of this does sound pretty incredulous. And the themes of movies and television and news, radios, newspaper songs have often been uh, strategized and cooked up with uh, not only things to make you think a certain way and uh, feel a certain way about certain people, but also to keep people that are programmed under mind control programming. I was used in Las Vegas um, when I was a teenager with Elvis Presley, and I watched in horror as this man would uh, throw up after he had been programmed. And I watched him cry and ask, what's wrong with me? And not be able to have sex because he was so sick from what they were doing to him. And I had been sent in to have sex and deliver messages to him to deliver to them a programmed audience. And it, through my experience, I know that people like Elvis Presley are programmed, that people like Neil Diamond are all part of this, and people like um, uh, Michael Jackson. I watched Michael Jackson be abused as a child. So as all of us together that have been through this identify the people that are in positions who are programmed to have the fuller, bigger picture 
and we will be able to stop this and bring help to those that are still suffering. I talked a little bit about um, being used with Alan Greenspan in the Federal Reserve, and Henry sent me in. They had a very large um, organized strategy using a lot of the Federal Reserve banks to launder drug money into, and, and I would be sent to different corporate heads or different people that were a uh, part of this with different banking account numbers or where they were to send the money. And then Alan Greenspan would actually raise, they would raise the Fed the, in different areas where, where drugs weren't coming through so that when they were coming through and all this money would come through, it wouldn't look very suspicious. It would just all look very balanced. So these people knew exactly what they were doing and I personally don't believe Y2K is an accident. Um, I heard Alan Greenspan say that was just some uh, you know mix up with these digits, and uh, you better know that somebody that deals with money like Alan Greenspan didn't make any kind of mistake. This is very strategically planned. I witnessed um, people in corporations being all part of this, and people in the media, and I watched how they, if they didn't already own the people they needed, they they bought them, and that was through all these different ways of coercion, and they had um, very sophisticated uh, programming themes and one of their uh, larger mistakes was to use universal programming themes so that a lot of the survivors that are waking up are all talking about uh, themes like the Wizard of Oz and Over the Rainbow and dolphins and whales and hearts and roses and monarch butterflies and, and um, just you know, one after one. the agendas are in the book, and if you know what they are, you'll know a lot of um, how it works, and you'll be able to see it in the media. You'll be able to see the themes when they talk about uh, over the rainbow. You'll know that a lot of us were programmed not to remember what what happened over the rainbow. What happened over the rainbow was all the government stuff that was then hidden as they attempted to um, confuse fact with fantasy and keep all of this uh, totally and completely hidden. Um, let's go with the slides and, or the overheads and then I'll, I'll uh, tell you a little bit more. This was a picture of myself taken when uh, Henry Kissinger started calling me by phone. He uh, told me to meet him by the corner at seven o'clock at night and I knew even at this young age that that meant to meet him at the corner in the kitchen corner and to pick up the phone and he would uh, practice seeing if it worked, if the programming worked or give me messages and then he would tell me not to tell my mom so, uh, or he'd tell me she was stupid so when my mom would say who called, I had already switched back into another personality and I had no idea that anybody had called, no one and that was it. So this is how young he started with my mind files and it's very uh, documented in my book, so it's uh, in much more detail. Okay. Hurry up, kids. <laughs> <laughs> the picture on the left is a picture of my mother and father, um, and on the right is a picture with my brothers. Uh, when we lived in, on Astronic Drive in Woodland Hills. And then the picture on the bottom was myself with one of my dolls that I was used, my dad used a lot of my dolls to program in different uh, identities. Okay, next. These were pictures taken at different times. The uh, picture at the top was uh, taken during the time I was being prostituted to uh, LBJ. And, um, then uh, down at the bottom left was my high school picture during the time I was working heavily with uh, Kissinger and with Nixon. And also the one on the right was a lot of government, uh, a lot of foreign policy with, uh, within the White House. Okay. This was um, uh, some artwork I did when I started identifying the uh, mind files and the information that I had. and I wrote all these little, it looks like little chains or around all of these top secret mind files because these were all the programs 
and I can't see it very well to identify it all, but it was like a program to have migraine headache, program to fall asleep if I began remembering, programs to become confused if I began remembering anything, um, programs to recall an 800 number and report on myself, that I'm remembering something and I'm at this and such location, uh, and so then they would reorient me back to UCLA Neuropsych Institute to come back in for some reprogramming. Or um, then on the outer layers are all the family, the satanic cults that uh, keep everybody in line within communities where uh, a lot of the professionals themselves are either under mind control or are participating at this, um, keeping everybody under control. So there's webs within communities uh, where people are all under mind control. And um, certainly as families are cross-programmed, it's like my, my ex-husband, our marriage was arranged when we were 13 and we were cross-programmed with very sophisticated equipment in Ventura um, to fall in love and then get married and uh, he was trained then to become my handler and hand me over to people like Bob Hope or uh, Ronald Reagan or whoever it was that he was instructed under mind control to deliver me to. So this web is large and what it takes to get out of that web is nothing short of miraculous. And that's why most of the people that are under this are still in mental hospitals or in prisons or walking the streets homeless and they um, are not able to uh, get what the help that they need. I was fortunate. Um, I had no idea during that time in 19...